Well, here we are. <laughs> Welcome, Parsi. And I'll introduce Parsi in a few minutes while he's relaxing and settling in. It's amusing, isn't it? A journey across the Atlantic, arrive safely at the hotel, and it's just the last few hundred yards that are problematic. But we're very pleased to see you, Parsi. Uh, dear colleagues, it's my pleasure as the current president of BIRA to welcome you to this inaugural BIRA annual lecture. Welcome also to this location, the Royal College of Physicians. We walked in past various scalpels and other interesting objects, but I'm going to resist drawing any analogies or making any jokes about what their purposes might be for. This launch of the BIRA annual lecture is one of several initiatives that are being undertaken as part of our 40th anniversary. Many of you are BIRA members, but by no means all, so I would like to highlight one or two aspects of what we do and what we seek to achieve. Here you see our overarching aims, informing policy and practice, supporting and promoting the highest quality educational research, and promoting knowledge and understanding within and beyond the field. Those are our overarching aims. Only last week, uh, on Friday in fact, we published the result of our 18-month inquiry undertaken jointly with the RSA, the Royal Society for the Arts, looking at the relationship between research and teacher education. This, we believe, is an important document downloadable from our website through which we will be seeking to influence policy and practice across the UK. And I'm going to have to get that gadget back. And if you're not a member, <laughs> then you might wish to become so. We've already signed some people up tonight. Access to the best educational research through four peer-reviewed journals. Only a few years ago, it was just one journal. We now have four. Seminars and conferences bringing together researchers, policymakers, practitioners. Of course, the BIRA International Conference every autumn looks at a wide range of the latest research. As a member, you get access, you get sent our uh, members' magazine, Research Intelligence, and also the Insights publications, examples of which are out in the foyer. We celebrate research excellence through a range of fellowships and awards, and we offer opportunities for peer engagement through SIG, special interest groups. Registration for this year's annual conference is open, and indeed, Nick Johnson, our executive officer, asked me to remind you early bird applications finish in a week's time. Is that right, Nick? A week? Friday. Friday. So you've got a couple of days if you want to get the reduced rate. Members and non-members are all welcome at the conference, and this year it's being held just down the road at the Institute of Education. In 1995, BIRA was celebrating its 21st anniversary it's coming of age, at least in the old currency when I was growing up. They say about 40, don't they, or they used to, that life begins at 40. So it's interesting to compare the 21st birthday with our 40th. I'm delighted that this evening one of our guests is Roger Murphy, who assumed the Bureau presidency in that year, 1995, and gave his presidential address at the University of Bath when the BIRA conference was held jointly with the launch conference of the European Educational Research Association. Roger had been leading a working group on the future of BIRA, which led to various changes in the purposes and aims for the association as it moved to adulthood in its 21st year. It's well worth reading that lecture to see what has changed and what has not. After Roger had reflected on the need to, quote, realize the potential of educational research, something we might now call impact, Roger concluded by reminding us that 
The skills of the researcher are to ask challenging and sometimes uncomfortable questions. Well, if that was true in 1995, I suggest it's even more apposite today. When I gave my own inaugural lecture as Bureau President at our conference last September at the University of Sussex, I suggested an increased public role for the association. We all know that education has become increasingly the site of political interest and contestation. Only a couple of weeks ago in Oxford, I heard Andrew Adonis, one of the key political players in the architecture of English education over recent years, suggesting that the start of that politicization process was marked by Prime Minister James Callaghan's famous speech at Ruskin College in 1976. In other words, in this view, Beera's existence has more or less coincided with this period of increased political intervention in education. And while policies are clearly very different in each part of the UK, nevertheless, the general trend has been similar across all four jurisdictions. There is an important role for an association like ours to contribute to this public debate, especially through drawing upon the research evidence generated by our members. And when I was talking, giving my inaugural lecture at Sussex, one of the examples of critical analysis I drew on was indeed the work of our speaker this evening, Parsi Salberg. We were delighted that Parsi agreed to be our very first annual lecturer. He has a reputation as a shrewd and critical thinker on education, a veritable public intellectual. Having worked as a school teacher, teacher educator and policymaker in national and international contexts, he brings a huge range of experience to bear. Through his work, we know that there are some fascinating lessons to be learned from his home context, Finland. Finnish Lessons, indeed, is the title of his influential book. But we also know that there are several paradoxes in the story of Finnish success. We note also how politicians closer at home can be somewhat selective in their references to the successes of Finland. For example, highlighting their PISA results, but failing to acknowledge some fundamental socio-economic, historical and cultural differences between the UK and Finland. Famously, Parsi coined the term which captures aspects of the whole internationalization of educational policy so well. He called it the germ, the global education reform movement. Parsi, we're looking very, very much forward. We are very much looking forward to hearing about your recent thinking, developing during your current position as professor of practice in the graduate school of Harvard University. We hope that in spite of our slightly delayed start, there'll be time uh, at the end for a few questions. But would you all now please join me in welcoming, welcoming Parsi Salberg to give the inaugural Beer Annual Lecture, Facts, True Facts and Research in Improving Education Systems. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I, I got lost in London. I actually went to the wrong place, but I was very fortunate to have somebody else who came to the wrong place with me. Otherwise, I would be still there. Um, is there anything you can do with the, um, to get the whole uh, image over there? Because I, I probably I need to say a couple of things first about the, uh, the the warm feeling that I have to be back in London. I, I started my early academic uh, career here in, at King's College London a long time ago. This was a time when England had just introduced the first national curriculum and, and there was a lot of excitement and fears also at that time. In early, it was in 1990-1991 and um, I had an opportunity to um, follow a lot of the implementation that was a kind of a unique situation in this country. So I, I went to a lot of teacher training conferences and workshops. Um, and as a young scholar, I was uh, excited about the library and information services that time 
Now it's difficult to imagine this because we have all the internets and emails and all these things that makes all the information uh, flow so easy and comfortable. But that time you really had to, you had to go to the library and you had to find these journals and books and uh, take photocopies, remember that? <laughs> and uh, carry all these things with you uh, uh, from here. And you know, there's one kind of a tiny episode before I say anything else is that Finland, Ian was mentioning something about the, also these paradoxes that Finland has built pretty much everything in its education system and, and this uh, favorable situation that we have on foreign ideas. There are very few, if you, if you go to Finland and want to see a, a true Finnish innovation related to practice in a classroom or school or the system, there are not very many of those. They are mostly ideas from England, United States, Sweden, other countries, so have been very good, good learners in this. But let me, now we have this whole, whole image here. First of all, it's a great honor to uh, have an opportunity to address all of you and this uh, wonderful association. I congratulate the, uh, the association for the 40th anniversary. I think it's a, it's a hallmark uh, event. But when I got the invitation to speak here, first of all, I was very humbled and uh, I thought, that, you know, what, what do I have to say to the academic community in England that is so much more advanced and richer than our own? But then this invitation came about the time when I was move, making a transition from Helsinki to the, back to the United States. And I had been there, f I lived five years uh, before in Washington, D.C., but I'm fine now. <laughs> and I, I knew that the world is very different. People think very differently. And when I, in my time in Washington, I, I learned one thing. that the, If you go to Washington, if, if you work there and live there, you have to learn one thing. One thing is that there are facts there, and then there are true facts. And there are two different things, so you can talk about these things. And that's why I, when uh, I was asked about the title, uh, th this, was the, this was the first thing that came to my mind. That I want to talk about facts, true facts, and then research in our work when we are trying to improve our school systems in, in, in Europe. If I was coming from Helsinki to here, I would probably call the title of this talk Myths, Facts, and Research. And my point here to you th this evening is that I try to show you that now when we have all this information on Facebooks and social media and Twitters and everything, the people are kind of a, in education policy, people are kind of a swimming in a stream of information and ideas towards the ideas and, and uh, knowledge that they like to see. Okay? So it's not anymore that we are, as a research community, we have a kind of an authority to tell what is the truth and how things are. There are so many competing ideas and often we are the, on the losing side. I think the, the thing that we are suffering from everywhere is that we are not fast enough for the purposes of uh, policy, uh, uh, the policy consumers, and that's why it's going to be difficult. So here are some of these things I was th thinking about. What, what, what do we mean by facts and true facts and, uh, and research? Well, this is, uh, this is something that is familiar for all of us. If, by the way, if you want to see, look, take a look at these slides, they are on my website already, and I'm going to tweet the link there, or you can just simply go to my website and, and download all these uh, images if you want, and, and take a look. But just for everybody to particularly remind that what is the research, that is a, it's an investigation of, of these facts and trying to make sense out of those things. Now, if you look at the literature during the last, last one year, uh, last year, what, what are people reading in education? globally, and, and particularly I'm looking at this from the, um, from the American point of view. It's very interesting to see that there are now books coming that are actually talking about the myths and lies and all these things. You probably know the seven myths. I think this, was, uh, this is written by one of your colleagues here in, in England. But then the Reign of Error, uh, Diane Rabbit's book, probably one of the most sold books, uh, educational books during the last uh, 12 months. And the, the brand new book from David Berliner and um, Gene Glass about the myths and lies. These, all, all these books basically speak about the same thing, about the, the facts and true facts and, uh, and a little bit about the research. Then there are some other books, again, you know about the school wars here in, in England. A similar book was published by the, um, uh, another uh, journalist, Stephen Brill, in the United States. And then the very, very well-read book around the world, the, the smartest kids in the world. And these all have something in common, that they, they, they are not really a research books. Uh, except the, uh, the David Berliner's book. But these this are all about kind of a fighting uh, 
uh, kind of a fight against the, the, the ideas and positions in education. And I find this both uh, quite interesting and, and also rather unique that we are having in this uh, kind of a scale of um, uh, arguments in education. So let me say a couple of things about this global educational reform movement. And this may be, by the way, we are researchers here, and, and this may be a myth. Maybe this doesn't exist. Sometimes I get messages from people when I speak about or write about the global educational reform movement saying that it, it is a myth, it doesn't exist. That you believe that it is, but it, it, it isn't. But I, I leave it up to you to, to decide whether this is something. But I, I have to say a couple of words about where, this is, where I come from with this idea. This started about 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I, I wrote my first paper about this uh, that was published. It's called uh, global, Teaching and Globalization. And I was asking myself, that, so, so how, how's the process of globalization is affecting work of teachers in a school? And I, I identified these early trends in educational reforms in different countries, the standardization and uh, the kind of over-reliance of uh, testing and uh, uh, increasing accountability over, um, uh, for teachers and schools and so on. And kind of a try to argue that there is something that the globalization is creating around the world around these ideas. And then ever since about 10 years, ago, 10 years from now, a little bit more than that, I've been working with several research colleagues around the world with the same question that is there a thing called global education reform movement that would be a kind of a, help us to understand a little, little bit about these, these grand ideas that people normally use as drivers in the education policy or education reform. Uh, basically saying that if we do, if we, if we build our education policies and reforms on these and these ideas, then things will get better, then the system will improve. And um, now I, first of all, I like this idea because the, the acronym, GERM, because this uh, global education reform movement behaves very much like uh, any pandemic or influenza or anything like this. It, you know, people get infected and they infect one another and then the systems come, become ill. And I think just like in, with, with our human beings, there are different types of infections. Some people get just a minor little uh, 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 kind of a flu and they can continue working and just like nothing happens. And with the same germ, same virus in, is infecting, creating much more severe uh, consequences with other people. So there are a lot, a lot of analogy with this, uh, with this germ. And these are some of the ideas uh, that I invite you to argue uh, with me because they are something that I have seen and some of my colleagues have identified these, these labels do not have a meaning in these uh, geographical areas necessarily. This is a kind of a global movement. And there are a couple of things like uh, it's very clear when I, when I have analyzed the, the uh, national education policies around the world and I've been working, I have had an opportunity to work in about 50 countries, 50 different education systems. And in many places I see this kind of a idea that competition is somehow the silver bullet to enhance the system's performance in education. Standardization, standardized testing, accountability, numeracy and literacy is becoming uh, one of those issues. Educational choice, uh, over-enrollment, and so on. So these are some of those ideas that I have identified ruling the world, national education policies uh, in different parts of the world. I have to also say that there are some good things there. Something, uh, you know, all of these things are kind of issues that you can critically analyze, but then there are some issues within this global education reform movement that nobody would question, like a uh, stronger focus on learning rather than anything else, uh, teaching or uh, other issues, higher expectations for all the children, uh, focus on inclusive education and special education, those things are all within the same movement. But I think more interesting things are the ones that have been kind of a included in these promises that politicians and um, decision makers have had, and now we can ask questions of how, how successful they have been with this. This is another one, the other image, that is again my, my own, not really a theory, but idea, how, how we ended up being here. This all started according to my uh, analysis here in, around here in England in 1980s. Uh, this idea of competition and standardization and kind of a market-based idea went to North America, uh, English-speaking countries, Australia, New Zealand, and now you can see that uh, these infections are all around the world. So this is a little bit like the HIV and AIDS map 30 years ago. Remember when we had the first time this kind of a thing that nobody knew where it's coming from and everybody <coughs> were afraid that I'm going to die with this thing. I think we have the same situation now that we have the same germ going around the world and people are dying. You know, there are people, young people who are taking their lives because of this. 
because of the education policies and things that we are doing in different parts of the world. So uh, I think we are talking about the same scale of uh, kind of a threat to the uh, uh, humankind. You see that there's an interesting, I'm from here, from Finland, and there's a little infection here in Stockholm. And uh, interestingly, this government here, this country here has been taking some models from Sweden. Anybody from Sweden here? Okay. But you know where Sweden is, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so that's the, the kind of a spread of the, the, the germ. And um, now you may argue that this is not real, that this is just a kind of artificial uh, construction of ideas. But uh, I can tell you one thing. I've been speaking in all of these places that you see this red dot. And I always ask if I have a chance to meet the policymaker or academicians or researchers that is this something are these ideas something that you can see in your own country and in your own policies? And all of these places, most of the people say that yes. So I've been adding these little dots here, here and there uh, as I've been going around, the, um, uh, going around the world. So now I think the interesting thing is, what I'm going to do, I've never done this before, so I tried to do something, uh, something unique with you uh, this evening. I'm going to try to see how some of these, not all of these uh, germ um, uh, sim symptoms that you saw there, how do they look like in, in the light of facts, true facts, and research? In other words, what can we conclude out of these, uh, these four things over there? So let's take a look at the, the competition of school choice, the, the first one. This is probably the, the most debated and uh, most controversial of all of these um, ideas within the term. Uh, and it's really been there for the last uh, 30, 40 years. I, I think Chile is probably the, the best kind of a laboratory scientific example that started in 1970s where the whole system was actually turned into a kind of a choice-based uh, uh, system. But, you know, this is often the um, uh, thing that people believe uh, without any evidence. They say that when schools compete over enrollment, the quality of education, not only the quality, quality of their own school, but the system will improve. Okay? And you can see this in many countries around the world. In all of these red dots that you saw, this is something that is there. Now, what I'm going to use here for the facts is the, the, the rather new phenomenon, which is the OECD PISA data. And I, I think that the, the kind of a interesting aspect with the OECD PISA is that it has fairly quickly penetrated into this area of scientific and professional knowledge and creating the whole new kind of a pool of evidence. And many, people, many policymakers are asking that should I rely more on the PISA data and the analysis from PISA and maybe research or academicians who are producing me uh, research. You know what I'm talking about here. And many people are there relying much more, listening to the OECD PISA as evidence for this. And this, I'm going to show you how often, sometimes it's useful, but sometimes it's very controversial if you really study and, and read the, the OECD PISA. Uh, data and, and reports. I often ask people when, if they want to listen to the, uh, anything about the OECD PISA. You know, sometimes pe people associate me to the OECD PISA by introducing me as a PISA salberry. Yeah. <laughs> it's an insult, I can tell you, that I don't, I don't like that too much. But the, I often ask people that, so, if you have read the so-called OECD PISA results, the last 2012 study, how many pages did you read? Sometimes people tell me that I read all 30 pages. Or they say that I read the whole uh, volume where they say everything which is about 500 pages. But before we can actually have a conversation about the PISA and what it tells, what it reveals about the school systems, we have to read all these five volumes that is about 2,500 pages. And the most interesting things are OECD has left the, the, in the very end of this, this volume four and five. <laughs> so I'm going to show you something that comes from the, um, uh, from, from the PISA. Now, if you look at the competition and choice, this is what the, the latest PISA, uh, the, the volume four is saying. It says that at the school level, if you look at the, at the school level, the competition um, uh, and, and choice are leading to improved uh, outcomes. But they, then they say that before accounting for schools, socioeconomic uh, uh, intake. Nobody understands what it means, so you, you can ignore that one. Just take the, the first sentence. The same volume also say that school choice and competition are not related to improved performance. This is one of the most interesting findings from the latest PISA study that is very clearly saying that the, the competition and choice are not related to the higher performance of all the systems uh, in, uh, in the PISA study. And then we have research. We have a, a massive research 
uh, small scale and larger scale about the school choice and competition. There are a couple of examples. The, the Versman and companies, they, they have used, they use a lot of PISA data, so they have been really processing the, the, what the OECD has been producing. And they say that countries that combine private management and public funding tend to produce better overall uh, results. Okay, and what does it mean? Some people read this that if we have more private schools, that will solve the problem, okay? But then we have something else. Um, uh, Heinemann and um, the other study says that school choice may lead to segregation. And this is something that, I guess it's uh, Suzanne Bibori was here, I think she was doing this study in the Institute of Education uh, about the Swedish case, where she's saying exactly the same thing, that in Sweden, uh, this big laboratory of free schools, choice competition and choice did not really lead to improvement, but it kind of like broke the egalitarian Swedish um, school system by, uh, through segregation and inequality over there. So based on this, you can choose whatever evidence you want and then you can write your education policies as you wish. The second one is a test-based accountability. This is an equally controversial thing. That do the um, educational performance improve if we hold teachers more accountable and test the kids more and use this data for all, all, sorts, all sorts of uh, purposes? Well, there's a statement here that says that with sharper accountability, we can create an education system which can compete with the best in the world. Do you know who said this? Who? Yeah. Last year he gave the speech at the parliament here. And this is uh, directly from, from what he was saying. This is the, um, what the OECD is saying, that the school autonomy has a positive relationship with uh, student performance when accountability measures are in place. What does it mean? Well, you can read this as uh, having a strong accountability over teachers and schools and give them freedom, autonomy to fire and hire stuff. Okay? And then you have the evidence-based education policies again in, in place. Research, um, one of the, the kind of a large-scale research, this is from the United States, uh, the Education Research Council published the, the study that says that the research to date su suggests that the, the benefits of test-based incentive programs over the past two, two decades have been quite um, small. Okay? Again, choose what you want. You can choose uh, the policy you want. How about parental involvement? Again, there's something that you probably saw. This was in, a, in your newspaper a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, saying that the higher expectations from tiger parents in the UK could boost school performance. Do you know who said that? One of your colleagues, who is probably not here, I don't know. This is Sir Michael Barber's idea. That you should, be, you should look more like a Singapore and Shanghai and, and South Korea by beating your kids to work harder and <laughs> go to school in a weekend and all these things. So then you could beat, you could compete with Shanghai and all these other guys. Okay, the fact says, and this again the OECD piece is saying that parents' engagement with the 15-year-olds is strongly associated with a better performance in PISA. Okay, so you can, you can justify the first, the myth, the argument with this one, okay? But then, let's take a look at the research. Again, there's a lot of research about the parental involvement. How, how does it play, what role does it play in learning? There's a brand new study just published a couple of weeks ago, a huge um, longitudinal study in the United States that says there's no clear connection between parental involvement and improved student performance. Actually, in this study, they can show that there's a negative correlation between parental involvement if it's done in the wrong way. So if the parents sit with the, the students and insist that they have to do everything correctly, that is often kind of a counterproductive. So again, you can choose whatever uh, evidence you want and you can do whatever you do, want to do in, a, in your policies and say that this is based on evidence. Evidence-based, uh, bulletproof, system-proof uh, policies. And then finally, the, the, my favorite one is this teacher policy that is so co common uh, now. And before I go into this, I really want to um, uh, endorse what Ian was saying about this, uh, uh, your, your teacher um, and research uh, study, excellent paper. Really uh, uh, world-class thing. I have an honor to work with uh, one of the authors, uh, John Furlong, um, uh, in Northern Ireland government with the teacher education that we are using, we are relying, building very much on the uh, the research and work that you have done, so congratulations for this one. But there's, you know, one of these myths that you can often hear about teaching is, this says that the, uh, the most important single factor in improving quality of education is teachers. Yeah? Who could disagree with this? Yeah? Let's go for, for it. And then we can kind of shape and build our education policies. In the United States, when the authorities and decision makers 
are using this and many private foundations, they conclude that the conclusion is that the, the problem is solved when we get rid of bad te teachers, right? Because there's nothing more important than a good teacher. So the problem is how to get rid of bad teachers, how to fire them and how to say, change the system so that these bad people can never get into the schools. But there's much more than this, okay? Now, again, the OECD, and this is what Andreas Leischer, for example, always when he speaks about PISA, he's always saying this, that the quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. Again, who could disagree with this statement except me? <laughs> because I don't think that this is, both of these things are lie, that they're myths, okay? Because if you be believe that this is, the, this is the case, then you belong to those who believe that it's all about teachers. So the problem is, the challenge is to get the best and the brightest in the school system, and they will solve all the problems of poverty and all the in inequalities in our societies because they're so great teachers, great people. But that's, uh, that's not over there. I th the, the biggest difficulty I have with this one is that this assumes that teaching is a kind of a individual, um, isolated profession. It's like a marathon run. You put all these teachers in the same line and you see who is, the, who is in the finish line the first. But everybody, all the teachers here, you know that teaching is a team sport. It's something where the team can be much more than the sum of its uh, members, right? Just look at your football teams here in England. Manchester City. <laughs> I don't know, do they have the best players? Maybe. Yeah. They do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then there's... The, but then there's Burnley. Is any, anybody supporting Burnley here? I think Burnley went up to the, uh, pre uh, the uh, Premier League. And, yeah, and they, they, you know, they, they were playing as a team. So I think we should, we should see the school exactly the same as we should see a football, or ice hockey, basketball team. That if you have a coach, if you have a mission, if you have leadership, if, if people have purpose of doing something, they will do much more when they, when they can do these things together than when they were doing these things alone. Again, you know, research is, this is one of the most researched areas of all in our, our um, uh, school lives. This is done, this start, started in early, uh, mid-1960s when the kind of a monumental study called Coleman, study of Coleman report uh, concluded that schools don't really matter because the, uh, the most of the influence, of, well, most of the variance that we uh, associated to students' uh, achievement in school falls in the factors outside of the school, okay? And this is something, uh, Cold Harbor is one of the, the leading researchers of this field um, at the moment, and he and his um, uh, group concluded that only about 9% of the, the variation in student achievement is due to teacher character, characteristics. 9%, okay? 60%, according to their studies, is outside of the school. Family, parents, peer, uh, students' individual characteristics, and so on. So how can we hold teachers accountable for this 60% uh, that they have no control over statistically, okay? Again, this is, uh, you can choose whatever you believe in yeah, and build your education policies and re uh, reforms. Interesting question is that somebody here may have been thinking about this. Do we have any evidence about this global education reform movement? Any of these four elements or the other symptoms that when systems have been built and policies have been built around these ideas, what has happened, okay? One thing we can, we can use again is the OECD PISA data, which is a kind of an interesting collection of different types of things. Um, if, you, if you put your researchers, academicians' lenses on there, a lot of problems with this image, I know, because I'm comparing basically apples and oranges here. But you, you, you cannot, in the OECD PISA data, you cannot compare the consecutive cycles of data because they are treated in a very different way. There are some people who claim that the, the whole data collection, the whole kind of a uh, system methodology is, is flown and we cannot rely on these too much. Whatever the case is, but you can see that these systems, United States, uh, in England here, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Netherlands and Sweden, they all have had some or many of these elements of the germ in the education policy starting in 1980s, 1990s a lot, 2000s and still today and you will see that none of those education systems have been able to improve, enhance the math performance of the 15-year-olds, okay? Quite the op opposite in many, many uh, countries, the, the progress has been declining, which invites an interesting question. That, so how do you explain this if you, at the same time, remember 
that many of these education policies were built on competition, testing, accountability, standardization, um, and, and many other things. So let me close by saying a couple of things about Finland and basically asking the question that so how do these myths, facts and research look like in the Finnish case that Ian was uh, introducing over there. And I really had a hard time to kind of compose a kind of a reasonable presentation about this for you, but let me, let me try to uh, do something. Now first thing is I argue here that this, that Finland has, Finland is so well represented in the, in the global educational scene can be explained by the great teachers. I, I think it's a myth. First of all, based on research, we don't know too much about that. It's a, it's a kind of a very loose argument to say that the, the, the Finland has been taken to the top of the world because of the great teachers, okay? I'm not saying that they would, teachers would not play any role there, but we simply do not know. And this is something that is very easy to say that uh, high performance in Finland and teachers are related. Maybe they are, but we, we do not know that. But let me show you something that is a very unique situation in Finland um, and goes far beyond this, you know, what people normally, normally think about. I'm speaking about primary school teacher education in my country and it's a very different, obviously, than it is here in England. And when, when reading the, um, uh, your wonderful report, I understand even more about how fragmented the, the initial teacher education system here in England is uh, compared to Finland. We have eight universities, they're all research universities, training primary school teachers and they all do it through one program. It's a, it's a one kind of a harmonized master's based, research based uh, program. And we have 8,500 applicants every year to apply to these eight university master's degree programs to prepare primary school teachers, okay? And what happens is that we are selecting about 750 every year. So, you know, this is something that people need to keep in mind that when you, if you can select the among the very high quality uh, candidates, 750, that are not necessarily academically the best people, but they are the most fitting, the most kind of a, uh, also morally suitable to become, uh, to be trained teachers. You already have a, you are far ahead of many other countries where you don't have this privilege, okay? And then these 700, these, uh, these teachers will study about five or six years and they will study education throughout the five or six years. So it's an education program from day one, and they study all these things and more during their master's degree, uh, which is again, you know, when I speak about this in the United States, people don't believe what I'm saying, because they think that there, there cannot be a system like this where you so systematically prepare and provide all your teachers with the uh, knowledge um, and skills and values and all these things of all of these things, okay? And, and that's, you know, that's what is creating this um, Thing. The second one is that when we look at the, the teacher education, I, my view is that the whole idea of training teachers in Finland is uh, mostly misunderstood. That people don't see these kind of a, uh, essential elements. Maybe you here, most of you, you will do if you have uh, looked at Finland. But I, I've rarely seen anybody foreigner who really understand what is, what is the kind of essence of Finnish teacher education. And I'm going to share it with you now in two minutes. Okay? So there are four elements that I, I think we need to look at. The, the one is that First of all, that everybody needs to have an advanced academic uh, degree before you can teach in Finland. We are not allowing anybody into our schools who would come through the fast-track teacher preparation programs like you have here and in many other countries that Teach for All uh, provides a different pathways for people. We insist that everybody has to go through the same uh, advanced academic uh, program. Then the other one is that it's a research-based degree. So everybody, all these teachers before they graduate, they have to um, learn how to do research. N not only to be res research literate, like this, uh, your wonderful report is speaking about, but also be uh, competent in doing research, okay? And it's everybody, it's not just some, but it's all the teachers. So, that, so they all go through this, uh, uh, this type of uh, training. Then we have a departmental stru faculty structure in our universities. All these eight universities have a faculty of education of behavioral sciences, and all of them have a department for teacher education that I haven't seen in a system-wide level anywhere else in the world. That you have a department where you have, in Helsinki University, there are about 45 professors there in this one department of 250 staff. Huge uh, resources for research. 
just like any other department in the university has. There's a head of department, there's a vice dean, and so on, that is at the same level of, as everybody else, which brings a completely different type of uh, dimension to the, uh, uh, this academic work. And then finally, the clinical teacher training schools at the level of the system that I haven't seen anywhere else in the world, where all of these eight universities, they run the schools that we call clinical teacher training schools, just like we have clinical teaching hospitals uh, with the same universities, where teachers, young teachers can work with the experienced ones and see how teaching and work in the school looks like. So this is a, it's a very different, it's not just a master's degree, <coughs> doing a little bit of research. It's a kind of a systematic way of insisting that everyone, all the teachers must go through the same, uh, same thing. So then the tr what is the true fact then in Finland, if this is a myth? I think the true fact in Finland is that we are looking at the, a fairly successful uh, nation as a whole. I'm going to show you very quickly some of the uh, um, some, of, some of the indexes, uh, some of the, the performance of Finland in other areas. Now let's forget education for a moment and just ask ourselves that, so how the country is doing in business, in economy, in governance, innovation, you know, research, all these other things that are not related to education. And you will see that compared to uh, United States here, Finland seems to be performing fairly well. So if we use America as a benchmark, like many do, you can see that Finland is exceeding America in many of these important high-stake comparisons that we have, uh, economic competitiveness or innovation many of these things that we have uh, data. Then here are some of these things that comes much closer to children and families and education, okay? Again, you will see that it seems like Finland is not only, you know, doing good things, right things in the, in the school system, but many of these things actually happen before the school, before children go to school or after they come home from school, okay? Uh, Save the Children ranked Finland again the best country to be a mother which speaks a lot about the, the services and help and support uh, and networks that are available for every, every family, every child, before children come to school, okay? We have, we give a women political voice. Finland was the first country in the world that gave women the full political rights, not only to vote, but also stand in the election, 1906. And many other things here, okay? And this, uh, this is not unhappiness index. <laughs> Like somebody was hoping that maybe this is this one thing that where Finns are not good, that they are very unhappy. But this is a UN happiness index, which means that Finns are one of the happiest people after Danish uh, Denmark uh, over there. But there, there are many things that you know s looks like that maybe it's not about education. Maybe we are asking a wrong question about Finland. Just like Ian was saying that maybe we should you look how the country is doing, and not only in Finland but many other places too. That how how the societies and nations are treating and providing help and support for their children outside of the school. And my theory tonight is that this is the, this is the secret of Finland. It's not great teachers and small class sizes and beautiful schools. And they're all important. They're all there. But I think that what is driving, what has been helping the country to be prosperous in education are the other things around. And that's why I'm so concerned about the, the kind of... Um, nature of development right now in my country and in the Nordic countries because we are, we are kind of uh, getting worse in many of, these, uh, many of these elements. One of them is uh, inequality and everybody here knows how we are becoming more unequal as we speak. And that is a very bad negative development. Here you will see that I'm, I'm showing you how income inequality and student achievement, how they are related. If this is the international average I could ask you, where, where do you think England is? <laughs> Just give me a guess. Where do you think England would be? Manchester City. Well, where the Manchester City is. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is where you are. You're close to the international average in students' performance, if it's measured by these international studies. But this country also has a significant amount of uh, inequality, in, in, inequality in the, in the system, in, in terms of how the wealth of this wonderful country has been divided among people. But the United States is even worse. America is today as it was uh, 100 years ago in terms of uh, in a, uh, kind of a inequality dynamics. This is where Finland is and this is what makes us very different. That we are still ha we still have a system in place that is making sure that the, uh, the wealth that we have, that is about the same amount of wealth that you have here in England or in the United States, but we divide it in a very different ways 
among everybody, okay? And that's, uh, that's a different thing. So, so here are the other OECD countries, and you will see, you will see that the Scandinavian countries are here, but there, there is a kind of a negative um, correlation between these things, which is not a causal, that you cannot make any causal conclusions out of this by saying that when the inequality gets worse, you also get down, downhill with the education. But just simply indicates that inequality is something that we need to keep in mind when we are in the business of improving education uh, systems. And then the, 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 probably the, the most difficult one, and this is, I ask myself that, so what do we know through research about Finland? And there's not really research that much, because you know what happened in, when the first OECD PISA study came in 2000, they were, in the end of 2001, it was a huge shock in my country. Nobody was expecting that Finland will be anywhere except where the average European countries are, okay? So we, we didn't do any research, we don't have really any research asking this question, how are we doing things before 2001? And it took, you know, our strategy is quite interesting in Finland. When we read the first PISA results in December 2001, academic community like this, I was a university professor at that time in Helsinki, uh, our politicians and education authorities and practitioners, everybody concluded that the, by far the best strategy as a nation is to stay calm and wait for another three years before the OECD comes with the next cycle of PISA results and see if we are still there. And you know what happened was that Finland was kind of a progressing after three years when many of the other countries, as you, as you saw, they were going downhill, including uh, Sweden and the other Nordic countries. But we still thought, we sat down in the end of 2004, we're reading these piece of studies and results and say that it looks very interesting, but the best strategy is to stay calm and wait for another three years because maybe the OECD made the same mistake twice. And then they find that actually Finland is there where the, all the average countries were. So that's why we didn't, our researchers were not really too excited about this. Uh, many of the researchers were actually very doubtful about this. And many of them were very doubtful about the whole idea of comparing countries internationally. You know, Finland was one, the only country within the, the SERI, OECD SERI governing board that was resisting the PISA idea. Yeah, remember? We were trying to, you know, keep all the OECD countries not to go there and say that, you know, this is not a good idea. We don't need, we, we don't need this and we cannot do it. You, you cannot compare so different countries with a one yardstick, but we lost badly because of England and United States and Australia. They really wanted to have this. And a kind of a painful thing of this whole piece of thing is that all of those countries who assume that they will be on the top of the world, England, Australia, United States, Germany, Sweden, Norway, they were not there. But you know, even more irony is there that none of these current high performing systems have ever wanted to be on the top. They have never had a plan or intention to be the best in the world. So, all of those who wanted to go be the best have never been there. And all of those who became the highest performing education systems have never wanted to be the best. <laughs> Maybe this is the lesson. But you know, this is, um, this is what you see around the world. Oh, this lady away. Uh, you know, if you look at many countries, uh, many of the countries behind uh, uh, kind of in a history, and now I know I have met about 15 education ministers who have exactly this call. But they want to be the best, among the best, in the, as measured by OECD PISA by 2015. I think your Secretary of Education is probably one of those who's kind of a dreaming about England being the best, uh, best five countries. Um, this is how the, the Finnish way of, uh, uh, you know, thinking about education looks like. And not only now, but this has been for the last 40 years. And there's, this, this is about the only area that we have really researched in Finland. If you look at the academic research of our education system, um, the, the best research domestic area in education in Finland is our policy in the past. The, this kind of a dark area or era of poli education policy that we knew nothing about, starting from the 1970s all the way until the first piece that came around. So we have been trying to understand what it is, and this is exactly I'll conclude, the different researchers have come to this very same conclusion that the one of the kind of a central idea of Finnish education system and policy is this equality and equity emphasis throughout the, systematically throughout the education system, um, which is a kind of an interesting uh, finding. So let me show you this uh, just very quickly and then move to my conclusion here. 
Um, you know, if you look at these, some of these germ ideas that I was speaking about in the, in the beginning and ask the question that, so how do these look like in Finland? And, you know, this is what makes Finnish education system often kind of exciting, that people find it interesting that a country can do so differently compared to these main ideas, like uh, here having collaboration, we have a lot of trust and responsibility in the system rather than uh, testing and uh, accountability. This human capital here refers to this teacher belief, that there are many countries who believe that just by training teachers better we can fix the system. But in Finland we don't think like this. We think that there has to be what Hakris and Fulan call professional capital, that is a combination of human, social and decisional and moral and some other capitals, that is much more than just training teachers. Um, finding your talent rather than increasing effort, in, rather than asking children and parents to work harder or teachers, uh, doing more. I think what we are trying to do is that we, we have tried to design a system where everybody has an opportunity to find their own talent, what they are good at, what they are interested in. And that's why, that was one reason why fi Finnish policymakers were so much resisting this PISA idea. Because it has kind of a, included the idea of bringing everybody to this kind of a same standard, that measured through the same standard. Because we have a lot of emphasis on music and arts and physical education and many other things that are very close to here. And then this uh, school choice and equity. These are two things that I think are very difficult to put in the same picture. If you want to have an equitable education system, in other words, everybody will be successful. School choice and competition are very hard to put in the same big, uh, image. I often say that you have to choose one of those. The more you have, more you drive your education system through choice and competition, more difficult equity will be. Okay? And more you want to have equi equity in your system, the better you have to manage the competition and choice, not to do it away, but you have to ha understand how to manage this thing. Okay? And this is my, my last thing here for you. This is another, uh, kind of another way to look at the same thing, and I try to show you how Finland has been performing here. This is the equity of um, uh, outcomes, and equity means here the kind of a strength of the relationship between children's family background and the education and performance, and the learning outcomes here. This is England, United States, Canada, and the other OECD countries should be there, okay? And you will see that, you know, this is for me, if you ask me that, so what, what is the most valuable single finding, contribution of the OECD PISA study is this. Because we didn't, this would be very difficult to construct without the data like the OECD PISA has. And if there's one good thing that we always have to remember, regardless of what you think about the OECD PISA is this. That without the PISA data, we would not understand so clearly how equity at the level of the system and the quality of student outcomes are interrelated, how they go hand in hand, as you, as you will see there. There are some outliers, Norway, Iceland, Italy, Sweden over there. But otherwise, we see South Korea, Japan, Canada, and Estonia over there in these high-performing, successful education systems with a lot of equity and uh, quality. This is where Finland was in the 19, early 1970s when we started to, when we changed the kind of a direction of education policy and decided to build a good school for, system that is good for everybody, good school for every kid, as you, as you saw. And this is the, the way of Finland. And you will see that there's this uh, unfortunate loop here where the both equity and quality has got worse during the last five years or so. And we are very well aware of those things in, in Finland. But the lesson from this one is that if you, if you are, are in the business of raising the bar, in other words, enhancing the perform educational academic performance of your system, probably the best, better strategy is to do it through enhancing equity first. Uh, in other words, closing the gap, try to close the achievement gap, and then the, the quality will enhance. This is what has happened with the, all of these five uh, education systems over there. So now, what is the conclusion here? So we have a lot of data and we have a lot of myths and facts and true facts and all sorts of things. And I, I'm, I'm going to close. OK, there's one more thing for you. If you were asking about the, the different jurisdictions here, it's, it's quite interesting that you have Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, and Wales over here. But take a look at this with your um, thing. But this is my conclusion for you. And this is something that the Chris Mooney, who is a political s scientific uh, journalist in the United States, I think he put it very beautifully about the, this is an article called The Science of Why We Don't Believe Science Anymore. And he, he's basically making the same, same conclusion that there's so much, everything, information and ideas, 
through different channels available. That what, what's happening among the education policymakers is that people, many people are kind of swimming towards the information and ideas that are close, close to what they think about. Right? And then they do make their own conclusions and uh, things based on this. And this raises a question for us researchers. So what should we do with this? What, is, what will be our role in the future? What, what is our role in, uh, in this type of uh, jungle where there's so much uh, ideas and information coming uh, all the way through? I think one thing we need to do is that we need to learn to do things faster. Uh, simply waiting for three years or five years of results out of the research study is uh, not enough. That was exactly how, when the, why the OECD PISA study was created. The, the main reason was that the, the earlier IEA studies took so long, five to seven years to produce the data that the policymakers, particularly in North, North America, say that we cannot wait this much. We, we need to have a study where the results will be available within 18 months of the collecting the data. And this is the same call for education researchers, I think, that if we want to influence in th how things go, we need to be able to work faster and uh, compete over these things. With this, I thank you very much for having me here, and let's have a conversation if there's little time for that.